Defence Dialogue, a podcast discussing contemporary challenges in the area of European security and defence. Brought to you by the Martin Centre with Nicholas Novaki. Welcome everybody to uh, another episode of the Wilfried Martin Centre for European Studies Defence Dialogue podcast series. Um, my, I am your host, uh, Dr. Nicholas Novaki. It's a pleasure to have you with us again. It's been a little while since we did the last recording, and I can't even remember like what the, what the topic was. But anyways, it's good to have you joining with us. Um, we've had a little bit of a change uh, in the in the usual setup. Uh, my colleague, former colleague now, uh, Mr. Alvaro de la Cruz, is no longer with us. Like he's moved on to new adventures uh, in life, but like have no fears. Like we have a an excellent. Uh, I, I don't want to use the word replacement, but an excellent like <laughs> alternative, the new Alvaro, uh, Mr. Uh, Theo Larou, uh, good friend and colleague also from the Wilfried Martin Center. So like Theo, it's a pleasure to have you here for the first time. Like, thanks a lot for joining. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, like, I'm, I'm sure kind of uh, like with you as well, like we're, we're going to have a like a fantastic, uh, super, super duper interesting discussion. And hopefully all of you will, will, will enjoy it. So. Today I thought I'll I'll talk a little bit about the Ukraine war again, unsurprisingly, uh, but more specifically on the nuclear t- tensions that uh, have risen uh, in connection to to the war in Ukraine, uh, because like that has become like quite a quite an interesting, uh, quite a scary topic, uh, in fact as well that has raised a lot of alarms both in Ukraine and in, in many European capitals. So the, at the moment, as we speak, the war has been going on for about eight months. Uh, there is no end, end in sight. Uh, in September, uh, Ukraine launched a successful counteroffensive against the Russians uh, and has now uh, deoccupied like large parts of territory in both the southern parts of the country and also in the northeast. And because of this, uh, because of the uh, prolongation of, of the war, um, Russia has become increasingly frustrated. Uh, it has announced measures such as a partial military mobilization, and uh, the rhetoric coming from the Kremlin and top Russian officials like is becoming more and more aggressive as well. And one really concerning thing is that Russia has yet again resorted to uh, what, me, what we might label as uh, nuclear saber rattling, so threatening the use of nuclear weapons uh, within Ukraine, or, but also outside it. And in, in particular, like Putin has warned that um, the West and also Ukraine, that like if they continue to push back against Russia, um, Russia does have, quote unquote, different kinds of weapons that it could use to mm. to push back and like basically like yeah, deter very the thinly West. veiled threat. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, it's 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 not a, like a very very uh, very kind of well veiled threat that, <laughs> but uh, we're going to know like what they're meaning. And uh, there's also like fears now of, uh, I, I was just reading the news this morning and the, the, the fears of a Russian false flag operation, uh, mm-hmm. because I think the, the Russian defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, was raising an alarm of, uh, of the Ukrainians uh, potentially developing and using a dirty bomb. Uh, but then Ukrainian officials and, um, and Western officials have like denied this claim and saying that like this is basically like Russian propaganda and the Russians themselves are like preparing a dirty bomb attack and are kind of using these claims that the Ukrainians are doing so to kind of like pave the ground, pave the way mm-hmm. for them to do that and then use these kind of fears as an, as an excuse. And all in all, it's a very dangerous situation kind of for, the, for the West, uh, for Ukraine. Uh, and, and the world uh, in general. But I think kind of Russia needs to be taken seriously, perhaps not literally. We have to remember that the first use of nuclear weapons is something that is part of like Russia's military doctrine. Um, and uh, it's not the first time that like Russia has resorted to this sort of nuclear saber rattling. Um, it, it did so like in 2008 when the US was uh, moving parts of a missile defense uh, shield to, to Poland. It did so in 2014 after the annexation of Crimea, and I think it did so also in February of this year, like when just when the war began, yeah, basically yeah, like raising absolutely. the raising the 
alert level of its yeah. like nuclear forces or so. So it's, yeah. it's not kind of it's not the first thing. It's not totally unheard of. Mm. That's no, like that's the uh, that's interesting. Um, and that's actually something I was wondering about because so obviously it conducted all this nuclear saber rattling in the past, um, but without a nuclear outcome, uh, it remains saber rattling uh, throughout that time. So. Um, I was curious to know what you thought was so different about this scenario. So obviously the stakes for Putin are not the same. He's he's wagered a whole lot. He's an international pariah. People in Russia are starting to doubt his invasion. So obviously the stakes are completely different. But do you think that he um, or do you think that the 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 conditions are there for him uh, to to graduate from that saber rattling phase to actual use of, of nuclear weapons? We just. Depends, I guess, what we mean by conditions, but I mean the capabilities are there for sure. Of I mean, course, Russia has a massive like nuclear arsenal, and of course, even if we look at the the number of tactical nuclear weapons uh, which Russia has, and tac- tactical nuclear weapons are non the non strategic, like non not these major city busting uh, mm-hmm. bombs mm-hmm. that. Uh, anyone who's watched a Cold War spy movie, I mean, knows that, like, I mean, what what the whole deal about, like, Cold War nuclear strategies, like mutually assured destruction, like, was all about. But these are, like, battlefield nuclear weapons like, but that would still nevertheless be, like, extremely devastating and more powerful than the bomb that was rip- dropped on Hiroshima in 1945. Right, right. Um, but... Would the Kremlin actually make the political decision to actually yeah, that's like, what use I mean, the weapons? Because, I mean, what, what we've seen in the past has been bluffing, basically. They, exactly. They've bluffed a whole lot. So can can they graduate from the from the bluffing to actually showing us, you know, a pair of aces? I wouldn't, I'm not sure, a like, if they... Analogy. If, yeah, like, I'm not sure, like, if, they, if I would call them bluffing, because even, like, the, the verbal threat of uh, using nuclear weapons, like, has a very... Carries very, some weight, yeah. it carries weight and it has um it, it has an uh, it has a political and strategic advantage because when russia russia does so i mean the immediate strategic advantage is that it they they seek to deter the ukrainians and the west in in this context uh, of, of pushing back against like russia in the east and the south of the country right. deterring the european union and, and and nato countries from providing weapons and and, and other kinds of su- supply to ukraine and then weakening the morale like within Ukraine for, 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 for the war effort. Mm-hmm. So it has a political aim. But then, like, who knows, because the Kremlin is such a black box and um, Putin seems to be at, acting more and more erratically at the moment. I mean, the Russian are doing things like, uh, I'm, I'm sure, like, Theo, you, you were looking at the news as well, like, this past couple of weeks. So you must have seen the stories about Russians, like, using Iranian... Mm-hmm. Um, kamikaze drones, yeah. like in in Ukraine yeah. as well, to attack populated areas. So who knows? And it doesn't. If the Russians would use a nuclear bomb, it doesn't mean that they would automatically like drop the bomb on Kiev or, or another mm-hmm. Ukrainian city, for example. There are different mm-hmm. ways in which they could do that. One, like they can simply do a demonstrative attack, which would be not designed to kill anybody per se, but it it could happen underground. It could happen like somewhere over the skies. It could happen. Uh, within a, an unpopulated area, simply to show that Russia has these weapons, it would be kind of a muscle flexing operation in a say, in, per se, to yeah. scare people. The other option would be to attack like some kind of Ukrainian military target in in, in the battlefield. But like based on what I've seen, what I've read, quite a lot of people seem to think that that would not be that useful from a strategic perspective for the Russians because the Ukrainian yeah, be a demonstration armed forces. Of force. It would be exactly, show yeah. that, you know, they 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 mean it when they say that exactly, they are going yeah. to achieve their objectives and they will stop at nothing to do it. It's uh it's 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 what you say. There's a political element to saying that you're gonna use it and then using it has beyond the military considerations, uh political uh elements of, of demonstrating yeah, one's, yeah, yeah. one's uh, commitment uh, to reaching one's objectives. Um but uh, another thing that struck me was that in parallel to this declaration that they're willing to use these nuclear weapons, they were also ramping up what I see as the more sort of um, underground war of attrition element, which is focusing on, for instance, energy infrastructure. The Mm. other day, the president of Ukraine was saying that a million and a half people are without electricity. You know, that is an astronomical number by any measure in a European country in 2022. Um, So at the same time that the, the, that Putin is saying, I have this this weapon, which is basically, uh, you know, my trap card. I can end this war tomorrow if I want to. 
he's still pursuing the sort of long term trying to to reach Ukraine's capabilities mm. uh, at at the uh, on the ground in people's lives in in ensuring that the state can't function basically essentially yeah, yeah. Um, so it, to me it seems like he is he is still trying to achieve his goals through conventional means because he's focusing on these uh, on these uh, on all these alternative ways to to, to enfeeble uh, Ukraine. exactly and I, I think there's also there's also a recognition that if the Russians would eventually like decide to go go via the nuclear option, I mean, it would be Russia would become even more of an international pariah than it is at the moment. And I don't mean mm-hmm. just a, uh, just being kind of absolutely um, pushed back and, and being isolated, like by the West, by the European Union, by the NATO. But I think that in that sort of scenario, I mean, Russia would lose partners and allies. Uh, in, in, in Asia, like I think China would get right. extremely scared. I think India oh, yeah. would get extremely would scared. Tomorrow. And it would just destroy this entire, I think, post-World War II UN system and and, and, and the norm of not using nuclear weapons like in a battle, mm-hmm. battlefield setting. Because as I said, it would be the first time since 1945 that like this would be, this would happen in, in a conflict situation. So it would be an absolutely Un- unprecedented situation and like who knows I mean how the how the world would react although to be fair on the question of the UN order I think that doesn't really enter Putin's considerations because you know he would be destroying an order in which he always played second fiddle you yeah know, it's to him it's it's no big yeah, deal yeah. to the Chinese it would be because the Chinese they want this they want to be, be the owners of this this yeah. order they're they're trying to take over the United States but to Russia, they know they'll never displace either the United States or China as as the global hegemon. So yeah. to them, it's to them, it's it's whatever. That's a good point. And like also, I think just like I mean, we're in Brussels. I mean, we work on EU matters, and I think it's also like quite remarkable that in in this context, the European Union as an organization like is in a place in which it has to consider and plan for the possibility that Russia might eventually. God forbid, like use mm-hmm. a nuclear weapon in in, in Ukraine and uh, Borrell, the EU's high representative, Joseph uh, Joseph Borrell has, has has said that Putin should uh, be taken seriously. Um, like very extraordinarily, he also said that um, he was giving a speech a couple of weeks ago, and and in that speech he mentioned that the Russian army will be annihilated if Russia would use a nuclear weapon in Ukraine. Was absolutely extraordinary rhetoric, like coming yeah. from a top like EU official or EU leader. Yeah. And it's extraordinary, especially like when we think that if the EU has as an organization has traditionally self-identified as a kind of semi-pacifist, like normative power mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. can change Absolutely. like international rules and, 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 and the behavior of other actors, like simply through the power of its own like virtuous existence and, and the power of its like norms and, and, and values. And now we're now now we're in a place in which the, the European Union and its leaders are talking about an, an, annihilating uh, no. the, the, the Russian army and talking about nuclear war. But it just underlines like how serious the situation is yeah. at, at the same time. I think it's also, you know, personal frustrations and ambitions that are or ambitions might not be the right word, but frustrations definitely that are shared by millions of Europeans. You know, the idea that the, this one man can threaten all of our lives like this, I think, frustrates a lot of people. And... I think it was just a personal aspect uh, that was just going beyond the EU's values, going beyond what the EU has typically stood for, as you say, in the past. And it was just a, an expression, I think, of humanity, I suppose. Um, yeah, absolutely. It was, uh, it was uh, and it's rare to yeah. see someone who's so, you know, their 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 role is is a their person. They become they become their role basically. Yeah, the term. And, you're right. Uh, and he left that that role for a few minutes and it, it is surreal as you say but at the same time i think I, I i appreciate i mean i'm not sure if that was necessarily the best best choice of words but i appreciate that sort of like openness and honesty yeah. like coming from like top yeah. eu people because i mean let's be honest yeah we do like, tend to cloud our our eyes yeah when it comes to these things a lot yeah <laughs> and like put put our heads into the sand the same way as uh, like the, the statue statue just behind the european parliament like for those of you mm-hmm. who have never been in brussels and like never visited the um the, uh, the 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 European Parliament or other institutions here. There's a fantastic statue just um, behind the European Parliament. Uh, there's a small like parky area, and there's a group of uh, what I think are ostriches, 
uh, and all of the ostriches, par one, like have their like heads buried in the sand. And like, yeah. I mean, it, it's always like, puzzled me. Like, I mean, what the what the symbolism of, of this is behind the European Parliament? But but indeed, I mean, I, th I think more and more of the EU ostriches are uh, uh, kind of lifting their heads like from the sand, especially yeah. in the foreign and security policy uh, context. These of days. course, of course. I mean, the Russian invasion was such a it was such a wake-up call, you know. It's it's unavoidable that something like this was going to happen. Um, Borrell himself even said that his own people prior to the invasion didn't even tell him or were telling him, no, Russia won't invade, no, Russia won't invade. Yeah. And it was Anthony Blinken, U.S. Secretary of State, who called him two days before the invasion and said, look, no matter what your people are telling you, they will invade. And sure enough, two days later, they did. So I think that's also kind of the, oh, wow, like perhaps we do have some catching up to do in the, in the realm of foreign security policy. Um, and yeah, Hopefully, more and more of uh, the EU ostriches, as you say, will will lift their heads out of the sand. Hopefully, and and I do hope that, like moving forward, that there there wouldn't be any more of these taboo topics that could not be really discussed yeah. or debated, like even Absolutely. in the EU context. And there's nuclear nuclear weapons issue, nuclear war issue, like has been for decades. I think the ultimate taboo topic, like right. in the context of EU foreign policy cooperation, EU security policy cooperation, right. and that that's of course because. Um, most EU countries are also NATO members, and they see that this is something that needs to be discussed like exclusively in the context, uh, in the framework of NATO, mm -hmm. or within the national, uh, or in the national capitals, which is the case with France, uh, right. because France, even though it's a NATO member, doesn't even participate in the top uh, NATO nuclear weapons like planning forum because it sees that like it's it's this is primarily national like matter for it. Mm. Um, That's our legacy from Charles de Gaulle. Exactly. Yeah. But but there's so far I mean there's been kind of no major debate or discussion as far as I'm uh, as far as I know in the EU confines about what what sort of role nuclear weapons uh, what sort of what would what sort of role nuclear weapons will play in the context of like broader EU security cooperation what would it what it mean for the EU security cooperation if nu a nuclear weapon would be used uh, in the EU's extended neighborhood how the EU would react. And uh, I think these are all like issues that like need to be taken, unfortunately and very regrettably, like more and more seriously of and, and just uh, discussed. Of course. But I think kind of that uh, we, we live in a very interesting moment in history, and it just always like reminds me of the the book that uh, or the article that like Francis Fukuyama wrote like in the late eighties about like the end of history and like how how every country is moving towards some form of like liberal democracy mm -hmm. and we would all like eventually live in peace and harmony and sing Kumbaya <laughs> uh, along a campfire, international mm -hmm. campfire. Uh, but unfortunately, I mean, these are extremely, extremely turbulent mm -hmm. historical times uh, that we live in. Yeah, he's disavowed that uh, that whole theory. That I whole think vision. so yeah. as, as well. Which is interesting because he's, he's managed to stay surprisingly relevant even though his, his big argument was completely disproved post 9-11. Um, but uh, he himself has said I was wrong. So there you have it. But fingers crossed. I mean, we're, we're, we we do hope uh, that eventually, like we get some some form of end of history and like things. If uh, I think normalize is, is is the wrong word to use, but at least like stabilize because it's been quite mad over the past several years, like with the pandemic, uh, now with the war in Ukraine. Uh, all sorts of conflicts around the EU's neighborhood and like et cetera and et cetera. And the list goes on and on and on. And um, and yeah, now we have the cost of living crisis, and like record high, high inflation as well, which I think is probably affecting you, uh, many of uh, you, dear listeners, as well. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but alas, here we are. And um, I think probably that's probably all we have uh, for today. Uh, I can't kind of really like think of like anything else to say on this rather depressing topic, uh, even though it's interesting. Well, uh, perhaps uh, for our listeners in Brussels, do you think we should pick up some uh, some iodine tablets when we're next at the pharmacy? <laughs> I, I, I don't want to like go on record and like I mean <laughs> like uh, fair enough being 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 the cause of like panic in in in, in Brussels, but at least kind of make sure you kind of buy iodized salt instead of like the non-iodized uh, like salt. So I think that's always a good and a healthy, healthy thing to do. That's true. Um, but but anyways, like I hope uh, all of you like enjoyed the uh, discussion today. Um, and, and and also you you enjoyed uh, having Theo Theo here for the first time. I certainly did. And, and uh, I would just like to wish all of you a very pleasant day wherever you are, wherever you're joining us. And, and uh, 
please tune in for the other Martin Center podcasts and see you all very soon again. Or not see you physically, but I mean, uh, perhaps perhaps we could have a live stream. Joe Rogan style, like live stream here <laughs> as well, like eventually. So. <laughs> but anyway, thanks a lot and uh, talk to you soon. Bye. That was today's episode of Defense Dialogue. Subscribe to our podcasts for more.